Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us at Meetup Live. Um, we're really excited to kick this off today. So um, just a few things. Um, welcome, of course. Uh, today we're joined for Happiness Over Perfection. Our special guest is Poppy Jamie, author of Happy Not Perfect, Upgrade Your Mind, Challenge Your Thoughts, and Free Yourself from Anxiety, for a discussion on how to reshape your mindset and adjust destructive patterns. Poppy's going to share the science behind rewriting our brains and the power of flexible thinking. She's also going to explain how to let go of setbacks, lean into love, rise above fear, and create a future that is exciting. So a lot of thrilling things, exciting topics coming up. Um, before we do get started, there are a few housekeeping items. Um, first of all, though this event is recorded, you will not appear in the video, so please don't worry about that. Um, please keep yourself muted so that everyone can hear the participant and um, no other ambient noise. If you have any questions throughout the event, we will have an opportunity to take a few of them. Um, so please submit them in the Q&A function. And then finally, um, closed captioning is available for this if you'd like to read along. To turn that on, just click on the live transcription icon at the bottom of the screen and select that preference. Um, so the agenda or the brief intro of our speaker, Poppy Jamie, and then we'll jump right into the fireside chat, close it out with a short Q&A from the audience and wrap up with some learnings. So to kick it off, as I mentioned, we are joined by Poppy Jamie. Poppy is an entrepreneur, author, rising star in the mental health and mindfulness field. She's the founder and host of the Not Perfect podcast and the Happy Not Perfect app. Um, you have seen her work in the New York Times, Wired, Fast Company, and tons of other publications. We're thrilled to have her today talk about her book and her approach to mindfulness and healthy mental patterns. Um, so with that, let's get started. Poppy, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be talking about this and it's so wonderful that everyone's joined us. Yeah, I'm excited too. So just to kind of kick it off, um, it's true right now we live in a society that glorifies perfection, hustle culture, productivity, individualism. Um, a recent study has shown that Half of millennials and 75% of Gen Z members have quit their jobs because of mental health reasons. Um, these are quite staggering numbers. Why do you think these stats are so high? I think that we are in a process and in a moment of crisis in our adaptation as a species. And I think that our biology actually hasn't changed that much. Um, but yet our lifestyle has. And I use a quote often, the human ability to create is so much faster than the human ability to adapt. And so we created faster, better, quicker, uh, bigger. Um, and without really, I don't, I don't think we checked in to say, but does this improve our quality of life? if we have a faster plane or a faster train or the fact that we can now communicate and the fact that the office never, uh, the office hours don't stop because we now will have Slack and we have emails and all of these incredible inventions. I think we're stepping back and I think the pandemic also accelerated this question mark over, are we living a life that is enabling us to thrive and to feel good or are we all suppressing ourselves, our individuality in order to fit into a status quo of who we think we should be according to others or what society suggests our life should be like or what we are told to want. And sometimes I think that we get to this point where capitalism says, yes, but surely you'll be happier if you have a bigger house. And I think a lot of people are saying, well, actually, maybe that isn't the route to my happiness. Perhaps happiness to me means spending more time in fresh air and within nature. So does that align with me working 16 hours a day? And I think it's a remarkable time to be alive right now 
because perhaps we're giving ourselves um, a moment to question what do we want as individuals rather than what society wants as a whole. Um, some really interesting thoughts there. You mentioned um, the role of technology, also the changing perceptions during the pa pandemic. I'm curious what you think the role of social media is in shaping our perceptions of what's normal and what's right and what we glorify. So as, as much literature will tell you um, and, um, and psychology, our basic human needs is to, to feel loved, to feel safe and to feel accepted. And social media has almost taken those basic human needs that we all want, regardless of what we look like, we all want the same things. We all want to feel like we belong. And social media, social media has almost taken that and put it on steroids because suddenly this idea of belonging comes along with a double tap of a like of this kind of like external validation. And if you take us back to our more primitive beginnings, to feel a sense of belonging in a tribe, that was an easier thing to accomplish to what it is now. And so this idea that we can now compare ourselves to millions of human beings, not just seven people in a village, and the fact that our worth is now attached to this idea of a digital identity that we have part ownership of, part not, and the fact that other people's approval is linked to our self-esteem, I think has put a lot of additional pressure um, on, our, on our lives, our sense of identity than it ever has done before. And, uh, and I think that affects our confidence. I think that affects um, our sense of self and our connection to our intuition. Because whether we like it or not, social media plays with our neurochemicals. When we get a like or we get that sense of validation, that releases a dopamine response and dopamine feels good. And, uh, and so then I think and I did it. I, I, um, I delivered a TED talk back in 2015 uh, that was called Addicted to Likes. And it just amazes me now, six years on we are still addicted to likes, if not more addicted, as our lifestyles have become more ingrained in our social media identities. And I would also say, to add to this, social media has become this really strange phenomena because it, it's, not, it's no longer, oh, Instagram is just the photographs I share with my friends. Instagram is now potentially linked to your dating profile. Instagram is potentially linked to your job profile. Instagram is then suddenly this virtual CV, but also is something that's social, that also is something that is, and so what, so, so what is this digital identity? And I think that it, technology evolved so quickly and we all kind of jumped online without really understanding the repercussions of, what, of the impact that's had on friendship and relationships and even our, in our dating lives um, to also our, our corporate lives. So um, I just have so much compassion to be a human being right now because it is confusing. And I think for anyone to, um, you know, and, and I, think that's, I think that's reassuring and important for us all to give ourselves that moment of compassion to say, yeah, it's not, it's not easy. And of course, like this is going to have an impact of our anxiety and our stress levels and, um, and our expectations for life um, because we're all working it out as we go. That's a great point to kind of give yourself the compassion and recognize it's not an easy time to be alive and existing, um, especially for younger generations that are probably potentially more online. I'm curious if you think that older generations also suffer as much from burnout and anxiety. I personally think that this is a human problem. I think that often we can say, oh, the young, you know, there is more statistics coming out around young people. But from my understanding, from my workshops, from my research, every single age um, struggles. And I think that perhaps younger people, um, there is less stigma. So they're a bit more vocal about their struggles. But um, now all, all ages are, are having to navigate online, offline, having to navigate. I mean, the pandemic was one of the first kind of collective um, threats that we all had against our health. And, um, and so I think it would, um, I think that uh, I, I certainly think this is a universal human problem because as I said, 
we all have human human needs like we all want to be loved we want to feel safe we want to feel like we belong and that that happens at every single age that is the human that is that is the the, the human journey um so i so i think it's important to ensure that every single age knows that it's okay to it's okay to struggle it's and it's okay to talk about that so on that note could you tell us about your book happy not perfect and what compelled you to write it yes so this is the book for anyone that that um, hasn't seen it um so it really came out of a health crisis for me i ended up in hospital um with severe chronic burnout and um and that made me stop in my tracks to think how on earth did I get here? And I started blaming everybody and everything. And then I got to a point where I realized that I also had a part to play in why I ended up in hospital. And it was very much to do with my perfectionism. Like everything had to be perfect. And if it was not perfect, then I would destroy myself. And perfectionism is linked to a very, very loud inner critic. And all of us have an inner critic. We all have that voice inside of ourselves that tells us all our fears. Our inner critic knows us better than our, we know ourselves. And that's why it's so dangerous and so destructive to our self-esteem and how we feel about ourselves. And, um, and I was, and, you know, perfectionism went along with people pleasing for me I wanted to make sure that everybody was happy I put everyone's needs before my own god forbid I would upset someone and I worked um every hour I possibly could find and um and I um and I guess you know I I was told that I could do it um and so as a consequence, I gave myself no, no room for no room for criticism, no room for a mistake. And if I did make a mistake, it was like the end of the world. And um, when I was lying in hospital, unable to move, and I was I, I, I loved coffee. I would have like four coffees a day to try to kind of have the energy to do all, all my work. And during my burnout, um, a crisis I couldn't have a sip of coffee like the cortisol in my body was so high that I became allergic to any sort of stimulant and I um and having tried to force myself to do everything I possibly could I was forced uh, my recovery was doing nothing which was like the worst it was like everything that I fought against this idea in my eyes of laziness when actually rest was my medicine and um, and this led me, this was six years ago, this led me into a deep dive into I need to understand how my brain works in order for me to understand how to work my brain better. And this was the beginning of my research, the beginning of the reason why I set up the Happy Not Perfect app. And, um, and then my book collates my six years of research um, in so it means that other people, A, don't have to end, end up in hospital like I did, and also B, people who do not have, have six years to research into how to look after your mind and how to work your mind in a way that supports you in a loving way rather than criticizes you. I wanted everybody to have the tools. And so this is when I developed the method of flexible thinking that has been my greatest friend in completely changing the way I make decisions, completely changing the way I live my life, and I've never felt so healthy and happy in, um, um, in, and, in how I define happiness in my life. Oh, that's incredible. Um, in your book, you talk about how from an outside perspective, your life looked, you know, seemingly perfect. Um, but inside, you know, it was obviously much different. You were struggling from feelings of anxiety, self-doubt. Um, can you talk a bit about that and what it was that led you to sort of stop and reassess? Well, I think that um, I started to realize that our early psyche, and if anyone who's done psychodynamic therapy, this will be very familiar to you. But what I realized is that my, the beliefs I developed in my childhood was what I was uh, making my decisions on in the present. And the past does influence our present, but what, I, but what was a big revelation to me, it didn't need to predict my future. If I wanted a different future, then I need to change my behavior in the present. 
And so, but the problem is, is that we have automatic negative thoughts and we have a negative bias. So research has found that we have a 70% negative bias, which is crazy. And it's because we are built to survive. We're not necessarily built to, to, to thrive. And so this is why, to, to, to go back to like full circle, at the beginning and your question of like, I, why are so many people leaving their jobs? Why are people so anxious? Like depression has increased three times since the pandemic. I think it's because we um, are we are so we are struggling to live in this modern day world with the survival instincts that we have developed to survive as a species up until now. And when we're surviving, it was in our interest to always look for the things that went, that go wrong, always look, always predict what could go wrong. So we catastrophize. Oh, my God, what if this happens and then that would happen and that would happen? Or we, you know, paralysis by analysis, like all of these different types of automatic, automatic negative thoughts we have. Um, or the fact that we, um, you know, like, oh, what does that person mean by this? Or what did that email mean? Is it because they meant this? And so that means I've upset them in some way. And we can just cause ourselves in to 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 get lost in these worry loops. And that was my reality day in, day out. I was constantly worrying, constantly trying to predict the things that possibly could go wrong. And so as a consequence, I was constantly in a fight and flight um uh, fight and flight mode and so in the book I talk about how the brain has two radio stations we're either on oh my god I'm so stressed out I'm in danger mode or we're in relax mode and go back to kind of our more primitive existence we would constantly switch between our radio stations sometimes we'd be playing stress music sometimes we'd be playing relaxed music and stress music was really helpful it gave us energy to move out of stressful environments back into more relaxed environments the problem is, and the problem what happened for me, I was just chronically stressed. Everything was a potential danger. So the email I received at 7 a.m. to the email I received at 12 p.m. And then I wouldn't be able to sleep because I'd be worrying about haven't done this, haven't done that, should be doing this tomorrow. Oh gosh, like what if this happens? And, um, and when we are in that stress mode and the cortisol hormone is released, that then reduces our immune system. And so we're much more likely to get sick. And so for me, when I suddenly realized that my mental health directly linked to my physical health um, and my just general health, there's no health that mental health, I suddenly realized, oh my God, I had zero idea my brain had this capability. And actually I suddenly realized I had zero psychoeducation. I had zero understanding of why my brain had started creating these narratives for me and the fact that they were based on these core beliefs I developed in childhood. Like I was not good enough. Like I was such an average child. I remember being in class being like, I have no special skill. You know, I had like Charlie who was like great at maths and like Luke who, you know, had the coolest hair and so-and-so was super popular. And like, there was me that was just so average that I was like, oh, I've got to try really hard that's going to be my super skill I'm just going to try the hardest but the problem is is that without any kind of like when we don't develop any sort of self-appreciation for ourselves, that is when we become a victim to other people's opinions so in the book I talk about um I talk about FOPO because uh, I'm sure everyone knows what FOMO is, fear of missing out. Well, um, um, FOPO is fear of other people's opinions. Oh my God, I was, a, I was completely and utterly obsessed with what other people thought. And when you're like, when you rely on other people's opinions, like you completely lose connection with your intuition. And I had no idea if I was actually living a life that I wanted to, to live. And what's so interesting is that I think we, we step onto trains that are going so fast and we don't even question whether it's going in the direction that we want to end up in. Um, and, that's, and that's what happened for me. I had to have a whole life 360 and actually, it sounds a strange thing to be grateful for a health breakdown, a total mental health breakdown, but actually it was one of the best things that happened in my life because it forced me to go, hold on a minute, what do you actually value? What does happiness actually mean to you? Not what you've been told it, it, it's supposed to mean, but what does it mean to you? And that was really like the stimulus for the whole book and whole and the building Happy Not Perfect, the app and, um, and the book, because I just wanted to make it easier for people. Um, you know, I, I could, I'm not a very good meditator, so I needed to find other tools that I could incorporate in my daily ritual that helped me look after my mind like I did everything else. I see. Um, I mean, as you say, these like 
very catastrophic negative thinking uh, types of thinking they're so pervasive they're natural they're actually like evolutionarily helpful um but because of that they're so hard to fight and change and recognize so could you explain how someone could kind of reshape these negative patterns and sort of reprogram your thinking into something that's more positive or helpful Yes, so this is why I created the flex method. And the flex is the idea that we turn ourselves from stiff thinkers, which a lot of us are, into flexible thinkers. And us being stiff thinkers, all of us have a habit of jumping, jumping to conclusions and jumping to assumptions. And also I'm sure many of you might be aware of like the kind of the grandfather of psychology is William James. And he came up with the equation that happiness is related to the gap between our expectations for life and the reality of what life serves up. And so that is where our stress bubbles up. It's like, we expect our day is gonna go perfectly. And then suddenly when something goes off, <gasps> stress bubbles up and in that moment we are not taught how to manage the gap between expectations and reality and it's when we have these um fixed ideas of we have these absolutes i have to be on work i have to be at work on time and suddenly then when traffic happens and we are unable to be at work on time <gasps> our stress our stress rises. But when we're able to negotiate with our absolute, when we're able to move away from absolute thinking into flexible thinking, this is when we're able to move into off that kind of terrified survival radio station in, and into a more relaxed radio station, which then preserves our health. It supports our immune system and allows us to be our greatest self, which is definitely when we're relaxed. The problem is, is that we make decisions when we're stressed. So the flex method is a very quick method that you can uh, use throughout the day. You either can use it preventatively, like as an exercise practice in the morning, or you can use it in the moment when you're in these hot emotional moments. And it's based on four steps, connection, curiosity, choice, and commitment. So first of all, let's take like the connection step. I got told by my greatest teacher, she would always say to me when I like got on the phone with her and I was like telling her about how stressed I was because this had happened and this has happened and I was annoyed with this person. She would always say, Poppy, pause, what a pleasure. Pause, what a pleasure. And it's, it's so true. Oh my God, our world tells us that we need to decide, we need to act, we need to react. But actually, when we react, we're in such a primitive survival state that we are totally disconnected from our wisdom. Pause, what a pleasure. In that pause, we have the choice to connect to our greatest intuition, our wisdom source. And I'm not sure if any of you guys on the call have read the wonderful book, Man's Search, Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl between stimulus and response and within that space that is our freedom that is our freedom to change the direction and course of our life and so a couple of tools and how you can connect and obviously this is all in the book is first of all the diffusion technique so i use the diffusion technique every time i wake up i use the diffusion technique when i'm whenever i'm feeling anything other than relaxed and it's just a quick sentence which says today or right now my mind feels and, that, and, and I invite you, I invite everyone on the call to do this with me. So right now my mind feels busy. Okay. And so such a simple sentence, why is that important? Well, right now we remind ourselves that how we feel right now is not always, none of us are stuck in these emotional identities. My mind, right now my mind, like we are not our mind. And so again, it separates, it disassociates ourselves from being within the emotion, which is so easy to do. And then we get lost in it. And then we label how we feel. So I'm like feeling a bit busy. And research has proven that when we label how we feel, we actually start to deactivate the emotional center of our brain. And this again was this huge revelation for me that the brain has two main centers, the emotional center which gets highly activated when we're stressed. And then the computer, the rational side of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, which is the problem solving part of the brain. And we will always make better decisions when our problem solving side of the brain is in control. But the problem is that we've got to activate the problem solving side of the brain. I think the biggest, like, the biggest problem I often find myself is, 
is my emotional part of the brain wants to make call all the shots. But that's when I start making I start making decisions based on my past memories. Oh, I know how that, you know, my emotional side of the brain is going, I know how that um, unfolds. That that's going to be like last time. But now does not mean like last time. And that means that we we again we step out of like assumption making mode. So can I, another way, a great, great way to connect to our wise selves, our problem solving side of the brain is to move our bodies, to connect the mind and the body. And so in, um, so in the book, I talk about micro flexes. So why don't we all do some micro flexes now together? Okay, so I invite you, I invite you all to relax your shoulders down, shake them out a little bit. And I want you to place your hands on your belly, okay? And I want, I invite you to inhale into the belly. Okay, so I want you to inhale into the belly, relaxing your shoulders down and exhale. Let's do that again. Inhale into the belly. Exhale. Relax the shoulders down again. Let's do that again. Inhale into the belly. Expand in the belly on the inhale. Inhale some more into the belly. And exhale. And let's do that again because we're together. Let's inhale into the belly. And let's exhale. Okay. That was so nice. <laughs> right. I mean, it's so simple. If a couple of just deep breaths relaxes our nervous system it's when we use our body to relax our mind it's the easiest and one of the most powerful ways we can start turning on that problem solving area of the brain and start to relax the emotional side it stimulates our vagus nerve we go and get into the rest and relax system and suddenly are we making a better decision from being in i must react oh my god negative negative automatic negative mode or just by taking five deep breaths and micro flex, we're able to connect to a different part of us and suddenly able to make a different decision from a different perspective. Curiosity, the next step of the flex method. Staying curious is the greatest skill we can apply to any situation in our life. The brain wants us to react quickly, but curiosity is the medicine for reaction. Curiosity, the question that says, hmm, that's interesting. I'm going to wait for more information. So suddenly we receive an email. <gasps> Do they mean this? Do they mean that? I'm going to respond. When we invite curiosity, we go, huh, that's interesting. I am going to pause and wait for more information. This idea that, and um, my, my, my inspiration for this curiosity step was a woman called Byron Katie. And she is just this just an absolutely incredible writer and, and, and thought leader. And she uses these four questions to help you invite more curiosity into your life. And, um, and so for example, like our inner critic is so loud and mine is so loud, hence why I have to manage it. You know, the flex is a daily practice. It's not like a kind of like, it's gonna solve you in one session. And so for example, my inner critic after this call will say, you were useless, absolutely useless. Like everybody hated you. I don't know why they even invited you to, in, invited you to do the talk. And that's what my inner critic is going to say. And so how I invite curiosity is I go, hmm, is this true that every single person on this call thought I was terrible? Is this true? And my inner critic's like, yes, it's true. They all thought you were terrible. Okay. Second question, can you be 100% sure it's true that everybody on this call thought you were useless? Well, I guess I can't be sure hundred percent. You know, I can't be hundred percent sure that everybody thought I was useless, okay. Well, how does this thought make you feel? Terrible about myself, like no confidence. I think I should give up. I wanna quit. I never wanna do a talk again. Fourth question, who would you be without this thought? Who would I be without this thought that everybody hated me? Well, I'd be happy. I'd feel content. And suddenly we realize that the root of our thoughts is usually the root of our suffering. And we don't even know if it's 100% true. 
So curiosity enables us to not get lost in this negative narrative that we can torture ourselves with. And then we move on to choice. Now, look, I don't believe that sometimes we have a choice to be happy. I don't. Life really can throw a challenge. And sometimes it's important for us to sit in that challenge and sit in the grief and sit in the pain of life. But we always have a choice to be kind to ourselves. And we always have a choice to treat ourselves like we would someone that we treasure. But we're not taught that. None of us are taught how to be kind to ourselves. We're, we're mainly taught how to be, beat ourselves up by not kind of, you know, like being a vertical commas perfect. And lastly, commitment is committing to the person we want to be. And I think it's so easy when we're stuck in stiff reactionary mode, we make decision, decisions from our fearful self. But when we commit to making decisions, well, how would my most loving, confident self respond to the situation? When we decide to choose our most loving, confident self, we get a different outcome. And Einstein said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing, expecting a different result. All of us love it, live insane lives because when we are stuck in stiff mode, we will always react to situations like we have done before. When we commit to taking a pause, when we commit to choosing to respond with love and compassion, we start to create a new future. So our ability to manifest happens in the present moment, in the way that we respond to life's challenges, in the way that we change and able to stretch, hence why it's called flexible thinking, how we're able to stretch our understanding of a challenge into an opportunity. And so obviously I've like gone through those very quickly in the book, like gives you like a practical exercises for you to develop a muscle. Because thinking with flexibility, thinking with, with an opportunity mindset over a challenging one, it's a muscle, it's a skill set. It's like literally going to the gym. It doesn't happen overnight. It's something that we really have to practice and train ourselves in. This flex method is such a powerful tool um, for helping people out of burnout, anxiety. Um, I'm curious if you could kind of go into what maybe some of the signs of burnout are and um, what someone should do if they think they might be approaching um, a breakdown, burnout, something catastrophic. So burnout um, can manifest itself in many different ways. So what I would say is what, what, what happens for one person may not happen for another. And what I would also say is that um, you know, I am, I am not a doctor. And so um, it is always important to seek medical help if you are feeling an extended fatigue that, that and look, life is, life is busy. I think it's easy for us to feel tired a lot of the time, depending on kind of like what your schedule is like. But for me, and I'll just talk from personal experience because I think that's easier. For me, it... Um, it, I was, I, my, I started to sleep really badly. I just, I would n was never able to turn off. And so it meant that I was exhausted throughout the days. I then started becoming unexcited about things that I would usually be excited about. I just had absolutely zero energy. I almost became allergic. It sounds ridiculous. Like I would get really anxious about even receiving emails because it was almost like it became too tiring even to respond to a email. And it was so ridiculous. I'd be like, oh, but this is like, why am I getting so tired about responding to an email? Um, I was then physically totally exhausted. Like, oh, I mean, the last thing I could do was go to the gym, go to do any exercise. Um, I was constantly hungry, like just literally from the moment I woke up to the moment I went to sleep. And then I would like barely go to sleep. And then I would be extremely irritable. And um, so, yeah, I think it's when you're like, losing love, for the things that you know you like and enjoy doing, I think they are, they're all signs that, um, that, that you just need to check in with yourself and maybe talk to someone. For me, therapy was incredibly helpful um, and I'm such an advocate of therapy and I'm such an advocate of group therapy as well. Um, but it's, but, you know, often we're just not encouraged to really take moments to check in with ourselves. Um, and to, and I truly do believe it's everyone's born 
you know, like born right to enjoy life. If you look at children when they come into the world, they're not self-conscious, they're smiling. Like we learn our fear, you know? And, um, and so I think it's really important for us to, to invite that childlike play into our life. And when that is gone for you, then that is definitely a sign to look in, to, to explore that further as to why. At one point you mentioned um, kind of tapping into that confident inner self. How do you find that version of yourself if you haven't really experienced it since childhood? I think um, there's loads of exercises. There's loads of exercises in the book and uh, to really help you tap into that kind of like childlike joy and also to explore why it potentially is not within you now because there was a point where it was there and there would have been a point when you learned that maybe it wasn't appropriate or accepted or you felt like you didn't deserve to be child childlike or you know if you had to over adapt as a child for example maybe you know you had a parent that you had to look after or maybe you had to look after your siblings or you know maybe you just you know like the, the, the childhood environment that you're in didn't allow you to play um there's many reasons why we lose our childhood sense um of play um and so i think it's really important to um, and a, a, a great inspiration of mine is Julia Cameron. And um, she writes, she's got a very famous book called The Artist's Way. And so she invites you to go take yourself on an artist date. And even if you don't see yourself as an artist as such, we are all creative beings. All of us are. Um, and, um, and so I think it's really important to, you know, take yourself out on dates and show yourself these moments of, and it could be the smallest thing, like taking yourself out for lunch, eating your favorite food, taking yourself, for me, dancing. Dancing is my way of like accessing that kind of childlike joy. Because again, as children, like we dance, we didn't say to ourselves, oh, I'm not gonna dance. I don't know, I don't wanna look silly. We allowed ourselves to look silly. It's only, we kind of like, have like learned these inverted commas adult mindsets. And I think there's just so much wisdom that can be found in us allowing ourselves to be a bit more childlike. That's great advice. Also sounds like an antidote to FOPO, you know, fearing what other, sorry, fearing other people's opinions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, a lot of the people on the call today are meetup organizers. So people who organize groups and communities and a common notion, a common worry that we hear um, new organizers have is this fear of being not enough, you know, fear of being a leader, having a lot of self-doubt, not having the confidence to run a group. What advice would you have for them? Every single person, every one single person, I, well, no, I don't want to say every single, so many more people than you think have imposter syndrome, because I think that we don't, we don't monitor our own development so yours, so it's easy to kind of get stuck in your eight-year-old understanding of yourself. And then you kind of don't appreciate all the work and all the development that you've done to get to the position you're in. And suddenly you're like, I don't deserve this. I'm going to be found out like, oh, I'm not good enough or so, so, so much better than me. And it's just the illusion that we kind of all fall into that everybody else has it together. Social media fuels this no end. Is this idea that everybody has this perfect relationship and everyone's doing really well at their jobs and, and we're the only ones like struggling and I write about um in the in the book I write about this thing called uh duck syndrome and duck syndrome is this idea that uh, you know all of us are trying to kind of glide across the water but underneath we're all pedaling for dear life and I think it is a lack of honesty in our general kind of like societal culture is that you know not enough of us are like oh god well I'm that was really tough or did you think that was a bit you know I'm a bit worried about this I'm not worried about that we don't necessarily invite us to be so truthful about um about when things go wrong but instead we you know we're all very conditioned to celebrate and like project and put on our highlights reel when things go right and so I think it's really easy to think that you're the only one that like hasn't got their stuff together but in all honesty in my group workshops and and the, my coaching practice like all of us are have got our own struggles and all of us are you know self-doubting in some way and all of us don't think we're good enough because 
you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's difficult to get through life without a bruise or two. Um, and so um, I would say, just try to be really compassionate to yourself and know that you're really not alone. It's a great response. Okay, so I have a few questions from the audience today. One member asked, how does one, um, a person who's been single for many years, not feel sensitive to the opinions of critics, whether they're family, friends, coworkers? I think this is such a brilliant question because I think at the moment um, we are going through a huge deconditioning of you know, questioning the narrative of why is being together better? And I'm, I'm not sure about you, but I know plenty of couples that should not be together. And so I would always say being by yourself is better than being in a bad relationship. And I have, I, I mean, I have, I've been more single in my lifetime than I have been in a relationship. And I have really valued the time I've, been by myself like you get to you always get to be selfish in some ways so you get to really think to yourself well what do I want to do today and um and I find that you know the friendships you're able to nurture are so deep because you know you have other 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 friends who are in similar situations to you and I think it allows you to be more curious and and be on a path of learning and I think so I think it's really important to to really um, take time to list all the wonderful benefits of being single means. And so when people do challenge you on it, you can say quite confidently, these are all the things that I'm really enjoying about it. And, um, and I think it's really easy for us to, and I know, I know, I, I, I understand it. And the amount of kind of, you know, holidays I've had to go home and have the granny go, so why don't you have a boyfriend poppy and you're like oh god and you end up kind of apologizing but actually um being unapologetically single i think is brilliant i agree so william asks how can we continue to deactivate the emotional part of our brain or not let it affect us as much I think it's getting to know the emotional part of your brain. I think sometimes we want to erase things about ourselves, And I think when we try to suppress, it only makes it worse. So in the book, I talk about in the connection step, you know, using, again, we did those belly breaths. That's really helpful just to defuse like the emotional part of us. But exercise, I mean, exercise, 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 and not exercise in that kind of like hardcore gym way, 20 minute walk five minute walk, getting into a process of realizing that emotion is just energy. So all movement helps us do is diffuse energy. And I think, you know, it, it, let's go back to our primitive selves, right? Caveman times. The reason we developed emotion was to help us remove ourselves from danger. So suddenly we would spot a threat, a physical threat, like lion. We would have that feeling of anxiety, that feeling of like fear that overwhelmed our body. But that was energy to give us extra oomph to remove ourselves from a dangerous, dangerous environment. And so now physical threats have turned into psychological threats. So we're sitting at our desk and suddenly we receive an email or text or an email or a text that like, you know, feels like threatening. But we just sit there. So we have all of this energy that used to help us move but we're sit, we sit there and then it feels uncomfortable. And so I just would encourage, and this is what I do for myself, as soon as I kind of like feel that tightness, go make myself a cup of tea, five minute walk, just like even just a shake out, even like a belly breath, just like energy, energy to move, energy and motion is emotion. Mm, and that pausing seems key just to assess, take a beat. Yes. Pause, what a pleasure. Pause, what a pleasure. Um, Smeet in the audience asked, um, I was wondering what is one of the most practical ways to get through the stress of over-analysis of making decisions? Sometimes I think what's quite helpful is to allocate a decision-making time. So often when we're like, oh my God, I've got to make so many decisions actually saying okay I'm going to write this in my notes section and I'm going to like 
think about the decision at 6 p.m. tonight. And what you'll find is throughout the day, you realize that actually maybe the decision didn't need to be made or you were able to gain, um, stretch your perspective on the decision at hand. I think we're, we are often caught up in this pressure to make decisions quickly. And, we, and it's quite self-inflicted pressure. because when we really have to ask ourselves, like, why do I need to make this decision right now? Um, and um, so, yeah, so maybe, maybe, maybe look into creating a decision-making time. And, um, and so it enables you to have more space in the day without having to feel like you've got to be in a constantly kind of like treadmill of decision-making. Hmm. What would you say to someone who's um, perceived inadequacies and self-critical nature holds them back from having meaningful friendships and relationships? I think learning tools for compassionate thinking is really, really helpful. And also, you know, I think group therapy is super helpful because you, within group therapy, you're aware that we're really not alone. I think often, you know, and a critic can be so loud and then we want to isolate ourselves or separate ourselves because of it. But when we realize how vulnerable other people are, we can take our attention away from us and actually put it on other people. There's this amazing man called Adam Robinson and he always says, you know, your attention can only be in two places, on the task at hand or on another person or on ourselves. And so when we're thinking about ourselves, then sometimes I think that can be a, like a cauldron pot for like insecurities and inadequacies to like be really loud. But when we focus on the other person, actually what someone else is going through, we have less time to think about ourselves. Um, and also kind of, um, and, and, and practicing like using the kind voice, like what would I say to a friend experiencing what I am now? What would I say to a friend experiencing what I am now? I wouldn't, I, I would be able to speak back to my inner critic. Um, and so in the book, I talk about naming your inner critic. That's a really, really helpful way of, you know, like separating yourself from that voice. Um, and, and, you know, and it's, a, and it's a constant negotiation, but definitely a lot of the exercises in the book would be able to help with that. Hmm. Um, Jody in the audience asked, how do you find the courage or commitment to do this work with other people, writing your book, giving talks, hosting a podcast, et cetera? In all honesty, the thought that, you know, if this talk just was able to be helpful for one person. To me, that is fuel to carry on going. I wanted to write the book because, you know, I just tried to, I just, I just, I just, I just wanted people to not feel as alone as I felt when I went through my crisis. And that was like six years ago when the whole world was not talking about mental health. It was not in a conversation. And so, um, you know, my mother's a psychotherapist and, um, and, you know, she's dedicated her life to helping people. And, um, and for me, it was just really important to ensure that these psychological tools that are so fundamental to be, to be, to being human, were just more accessible and also easy to read. And, and that was, you know, I didn't come from a medical background, but so that's why I've spent many years trying to be that translator. So the books aren't like these medical books that are very difficult to read. I wanted to make sure that all the tools and the, and every, every single tool that I write about is heavily researched. I mean, the acknowledgement section is like, I mean, pages and pages and pages long. Um, so it was important for me to provide research back tools so that more people could have access to them. Darren in the audience asked, do you see any downsides with this method? Um, I'm worried that we're possibly at risk of always seeking comfort with this mindset. Would you mind repeating that? Sure. Um, the, the question is, do you see any downsides to this method? I'm worried we're possibly at risk of always seeking comfort with this mindset. Oh, that's interesting. What a great question. Um, we're always seeking comfort. I actually would say that, um, God, a really good question. Um, 
I really like the question for a number of reasons. And I do, and I'm not sure if this is what you meant by this, but sometimes I think that culturally, generally, we're potentially not, um, we're not encouraged to sit in discomfort, which actually can be these zones of growth. But I would hope the flex method helps you to actually stay in discomfort as long as it is growing. It is, it is like in service of your growth. And, um, and I, because I think often we can quit things too early or walk away from things in, because, because we're not taught how to manage discomfort. So I would say, yes, on the whole, I think in general, human beings, we're not, we're, we, we tend to always, you know, um, see, we tend to seek comfort, but I think that's, a, but I actually think the flex method is what I was hoping is for us to be able to reframe challenges as opportunities to grow. But in order to reframe that takes, that takes a, a, a degree of mental strength to be able to 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 reframe a challenge like when I used to receive challenges I would turn that into it it, it, it turned them into meaning negatives about myself like oh because you're useless you're not enough this is what's happening to you whatever um and like you shouldn't do this you should just give up now whereas with the flex method it helps me to go no this this thing going wrong does not mean that I'm useless this, this, I'm actually going to pause and I'm going to commit to me being my most wild self. In the book, I talk about being wild, which is kind of like my most free self um, and, 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 and wait to see what unfolds. Um, how can I sit on uncertainty? And if you think about it, human beings, we love certainty. We crave certainty. We want to know. So that's why like something like the pandemic was just like so anxiety evoking for so many people because we weren't given any certainty. We've got no idea when it ends. We don't know if we're going to get it. Like it was just like, you know, it was like awful for so many. Um, but um, when we're able to sit with uncertainty, I think that's like one of the greatest, greatest skills we can give ourselves. And I hope that the flex helps us to sit in discomfort, not just seek comfort. That's a great clarification about the method. Um, I think it kind of also eased some concerns people may be having. Um, another question, oh, this is also about decision-making. Do you have any tips for bouncing back from decision fatigue? Ooh, great, 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 great question. Um, rest. Gosh, that's not a particularly complicated answer. Rest, rest, and more rest. We don't, again, we don't celebrate rest. You know, I think it's so easy to be like, I did this and I did this. Like we have this hustle culture of kind of like productivity, but actually doing nothing can be doing everything. And often I, for me anyway, from personal experience, I kind of often feel like I don't deserve, I don't deserve to rest. You know, I've got to work harder. If I'm not doing something or I haven't ticked off my to-do list, then I failed that day or something crazy like that. And so I think this idea of like celebrating, like doing nothing and um, celebrating getting a good night's sleep. And, um, you know, there was this culture of like, well, I only, I only need to sleep for hours a night or, um, and, um, and, and celebrating our self-care and celebrating others when they also recognize and, and, um, and value their, self, their self-care too. Uh, so I would say, yes, celebration of rest. Doing less is doing more. Excellent. Um, one more question. Uh, an audience member read that our brain has evolved to survive and keeping us happy isn't necessarily the brain's purpose. What are your thoughts on this? I completely, can, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Room. No, 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 it's fine. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally agree. That's what I kind of hopefully um, said in the talk. Like we're wired to survive, not necessarily wired to thrive. And thrive, I would say, thrive and however you take that to mean for yourself, inverted commas would, you know, would, would, would help us along the road to our own happiness. But you're right, like that's why it's a daily challenge for us to, to, to not step into survival mode, but to actually step back into making decisions that are going to make us happy. Um, so I would think you're completely, I think you're co- co- completely correct. Dr. Rick Hansen, Hardwiring Happiness, um, that was a great book. And, uh, and I actually, he, he was on my podcast and we spoke about exactly this. 
the brain necessarily isn't wired for our happiness. It's wired for our survival. So that's why I think this, this kind of these conversations and in this like whole conversation around mental health, I think often it's like really at the core of it is for us to pause and readapt in a way that supports um, our ability to feel happy and when we feel happy we're able to adapt quicker and this also then goes into kind of Darwinism I think there was a confusion in Darwinism that felt that it was survival of the fittest but he never really said that in his work he was actually saying survival of the most adaptable survival of, the, of those that can adapt to adversity and right now I think really the power um, are, are those who can adapt in alignment with that happiness because when we are happy our immune system's healthier and um and we're able to have a greater network of friends because we're able to have more energy to look after people when we're burnt out we have no energy for ourselves or others so actually in this is not a selfish pursuit looking after your mind this is actually a selfless pursuit because it enables you to look after everyone around you better I know I said one question, but I want to ask one more because it's so relevant. In this world that's so connected, how do we make time for rest? Boundaries. Boundaries, which, you know, often you can be in a job and it's very difficult to have a boundary when your employer at 11 p.m. at night is like, can you get this to me before, you know, 7 a.m. in the morning? And you're compromised, like, oh my gosh, I want hit their validation, but also, God, I need to sleep. And it's boundaries. It's, it's, our, it's our ability to say a positive no, like, no, but I will be able to get it for you before 12 p.m. It's, um, I think it, it comes down to um, our self-appreciation and also to re redefine rest as something that isn't weak. It's something that's not kind of being lazy. Rest is in support of our productivity. Um, and, um, and really exploring what that means to you. There is not one generic answer or generic solution that is going to be the same because all of us are so different, but we all have the same basic human needs to feel loved, accepted, and to feel like we're enough. What an incredible note to end on. Poppy, thank you so much for joining us today. I've learned so much from your insights, and I'm sure our audience has as well. Um, before we leave, I'd like to share a few slides that will be helpful. So this is Poppy's book, which we've mentioned quite a bit, Happy Not Perfect. It's available at Penguin Random House. We'll also be sharing a link after this if you'd like to buy a copy. Um, Poppy's website is happynotperfect.com. And you can also find her Instagram. We'll share a link for this too, but um, her handle is her name, Poppy Janie. Um, next, we have um, an opportunity for anyone here looking to create their own community and start a group. Um, well, you can save 30% on your first subscription by heading to meetupsavings.com when you become a new organizer. We also have Keep Connected podcasts where we share insights on community building, lessons from community builders on Keep Connected podcast, which is Available if you scan that QR code, you can also find the episodes at meetuppodcast.com. It's hosted by Meetup CEO, David Siegel. And finally, um, if you'd like a recap of this event, including a full recording and some bullet pointed notes, you can find that at the Community Matters blog, which is available at meetup.com slash blog. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, stay safe and have an excellent afternoon. Thank you, Poppy, for being such a wonderful guest.